thank you so much for joining me the, this afternoon. Um, one of the, uh, the most exciting things for me in around this currently this day and age because of what I'm what I'm studying is speaking about essential oils. I'm so always so surprised at how effective they are at, in, in many types of therapies and that's primarily where I'll focus on t today. Now this is going to be a really chock full presentation that has to be completed in 45 minutes and now probably 40 minutes. So I'm going to start uh, with no further ado. So what are the metabolic roles in plants? Well they're very much very very similar to what the metabolic roles are in human beings as well. If we think about pollination, the uh, bees and butterflies, etc., they're attracted to plants the same way that we are because of the color, perhaps the structure, but f foremost it would be the scent. Uh, the defense, it's the same once again. Um, essential oils and the oils within the structure of the plant are antifungal, antibacterial. They have profound protection for us and for the plants. The compounds in the plants will deter other animals. I spoke about the pollination where they actually attract the, um, the insects, but they also will repel the insects. The Douglas fir, it's the most phenomenal situation with the Douglas fir, that it will change its terpenoids and it will make them stronger one year and maybe perhaps alter the chemical construction construction of them another year so that the budworm will not become accustomed to the terpenoids that are being expressed by the Douglas fir and ultimately won't eat it. Today when I speak to you about chemical constituents, I'm speaking about the natural chemical constituents that are found within the plant and certainly not synthetic chemicals. So going forward today when I speak about chemicals, it's the natural chemical con con, uh, constituents that you're finding in the plant. So allelopathy, this is another way with which they protect themselves, but they're basically pr protecting their personal space. In, in the, for, in the uh, situation with different sage bushes, what they will do is they will alter again, they will change the terpenoid factor, and they will emit it from the plant, and in this case, um, eucalyptol and camphor, and what they will do is basically protect their personal space so that other plants will not grow around them. Storage within the plants as well. If we think about uh, lavender, peppermint, rosemary, spearmint, when we touch it, we immediately s smell the essential oils or the essence of the plant. And that is because it's on the out, the outs, the, the glandular trichomes are on the outside of the plant. There are also internal secretory structures as well in the form of cavi cavities and ducts. And then there's essential oil cells that are completely unique within themselves, hair canals and cavities of the plant, the tissue. Healing practices with essential oils dates back five to 6,000 years. Ayurvedic medicine has always used it in conjunction with the mind and body connection, and I'll speak a little bit more about that with the ethereal qualities of essential oils. The Egyptians mastered the medicinal and therapeutic application. If we think about King Tut, I have a picture up on, um, on the slide. These were the alabaster jars that they found in King Tut's tomb. Many of them were full of essential oils. What had happened was the essential oils throughout the centuries, as they were trying to evaporate from the jars, they became sealed. The, the cap became sealed to the jar, and there were still essential oils that, were, uh, that had been sitting there for 2,000 years. Quite remarkable. Noticeable advancement and as far as extraction methods were concerned was Avicenna. Avicenna was a Persian medical doctor and he um, really, as far as his contribution to humanity with our industry, herbs, etc., but even in the medical community as well, he wrote over 750 treatises on, on uh, many different things, philosophy, because he was also a philosopher as well, but 250 of them were medical, um, were medical books. And he created the distillation process that we know as steam distilled. And for a thousand years, really, the steam distillation because of Avicenna really hasn't changed. During the Black Plague, of course, we have very colorful stories about the thieves and how they were able to ro rob from the dead and the dying um, and still remain healthy. And that's because they would douse themselves in five of the most antibacterial, antiviral essential oils, being clove, lemon, eucalyptus, rosemary, and lemon. Did I say lemon? 
Cinnamon, thank you very much. <laughs> Renee Maurice Catfosse is who we can thank, really, in bringing aromatherapy to us in the 21st century. He coined the phrase aromatherapy. He's called the father of aromatherapy. And that is because he was a chemist, simply a chemist for a French perfume house in the early 20s, and he was making perfume. He had no idea of the medicinal qualities of essential oils until one day he burnt his hand in his lab. Uh, they say it was third degree burns. The only thing available to him was a vat of lavender. He placed his hand in the lavender and the first thing he said was that the pain stopped immediately. Lavender is an analgesic, that's one of its properties. Secondly, the hand healed within about three weeks with no scars. Again, a a lavender when applied to wounds will help it heal very, very quickly and will help with a very, and it will heal with very little scars. But it was, it was Gat Fosse who really started all of it. But I have to say Jean Vernet and Paul Belache, both of the medical doctors from Paris, uh, wrote books after Gat Fosse, based on Gat, Gat Fosse's theory. And they really encouraged the medical community. I have to say that it was Belache in the 70s who wrote a trilogy that really started the medical community in France and then ultimately in Europe, looking at essential oils as a very viable methodology for healing. In Europe today, it, it's used quite extensively and much more extensively than we're finding here. It's pretty much the holistic community, naturopathic doctors, aromatherapists, and of course the health food stores that are recommending uh, essential oils for, for therapy. Masters of application, if we think about Germany, England, and France, they all played a key role in the application, in the therapeutic application of essential oils. Germany through the inhalation, England through topical, and in conjunction with carrier oils, of course, and I'll be very specific about that. And France for in, internal use. Now, it's the French that's really causing problems for all of us, I'm sure. Because I, I, every day I hear a health food store tell me, what do I say to them when they ask me if the, they can take it internally? And what people are really asking is they're seeing things on the internet. They're, um, they're asking you if it's a pure essential oil. And I'm going to give you a lot of information about that as well. But with France, you have to realize that it's medical doctors, um, pharmacological aromatherapists, uh, people with profound degrees in chemistry that are recommending essential oils in, as internal. And it's also very, very short periods of time and very small, small amounts. Uh, one of the things that Valnay says is in, in his book about essential oils is they are poison, they are not poison. And he's referring to the fact that if they're used properly and sparingly, there are absolutely no side effects. But they can have some side effects if you are irresponsible. And really, quite frankly, internal use of it when we don't know what we're doing is irresponsible. Um, but, uh, Essential oils are antibacterial, antiviral, the list goes on and on as you can see. Sedatives, carminatives, analgesic, neuroprotective. But on the other hand, and this really speaks to that internal issue again as well, they also have some cautionary um, notes that need to be spoken about. Neurotoxic, 1-8-CDL in eucalyptus is neurotoxic. Children six years and under shouldn't be exposed to eucalyptus. Uh, they even say that between the ages of seven and 10, it should be very, very sparingly. So if you're looking for an expectorant um, that, uh, it, that eucalyptus is, take a look for children at lemon or frankincense. They are also expectorants as well and very antibacterial. Oh, I'll talk a little bit more skin irritants. This is why we use carrier oils. All essential oils are skin irritants with the exception of lavender. Lavender can be used neat on the skin. Phototoxic, again, speaks to the internal application as well. When we're using any type of citrus on the skin with the exception of orange, our skin becomes more susceptible to UVA and UVB rays. If we're using it topically, it's said to not go into the sun for 12 hours unless you're using a sunscreen. If you're using bergamot, it's 24 hours. Think about when people are taking these oils throughout the day internally and they're going into the sun, their skin's far more susceptible to the damages of the UVA and UVB rays. So again, a cautionary note. Some essential oils will lower blood pressure, are said to be vasodilators. Other essential oils can raise blood pressure. Uh, with rosemary, that's a cautionary note with rosemary. 
So I talked about Ayurvedic medicine and how there's these ethereal qualities where, w why there are ethereal qualities, why we feel balanced and energized, or for some of them they really make us feel grounded or they're uplifting, is because of the chemical constituents that are in the oils. Now, the chemical compositions, this is really based on Gatfasse's whole uh, research. He broke them all down to terpenes, functional groups, uh, uh, phenylpropanes, and I'll speak about those now. Gatfasse characterized essential oils into functional groups, and it, the French aromatherapy, and quite frankly, all aromatherapy, is really based on that distinction. Not to bore you with, with chemistry, because it can get pretty boring, but uh, the, really the, what the constituents you're finding in essential oils are the basic building blocks, starting with isoprenes. Isoprenes contain carbons and hydrogens, and what the monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes in essential oils is basically two and three different isoprenes that are, in, that are, that, that are coupled together. Carbon to carbon bond is the base of all organic molecules and the carbon carbon and carbon hydrogen bonds are typically very strong and nonpolar and are very stable and non-reactive. What happens when you then start to add um, oxygen to the hydrocarbon, you then start to get something that is um, more reactive. And ultimately, these are the oxygenated hydrocarbons that are the functional groups. So you have your acids and alcohols and aldehydes, et cetera. Those are in conjunction and sometimes completely separate from your monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes. Chemical reactivity is greatly determined by the functional groups. So when we smell and uh, the smell, the taste, the effects of an essential oil are based on all of these chemical constituents that I've spoken about. Needles and oils, and I bring this to your attention because a lot of, uh, a lot of retailers are telling us that the, uh, the diffusers become, become clogged and stop working. And it's primarily because people are using uh, oils from citrus and uh, also from pine needles. These are typically monoterpenes without functional groups and they create a lot of plaque in the, um, in the diffusers. So what's recommended is that you clean and descale the diffuser with an acidic acid like a, a vinegar plus of um, a we have a couple of different types of vinegar pluses in our company and it's just more of an acidic it has higher acidic acid one other chemical composition I want to separate is the is the phenylpropanes phenylpropanes really are quite separate simply because of their profound um, uh, bacteria their bacteria sides and it's like clove, cinnamon bark, cinnamon casea, basil, and I'm going to show you a few, uh, few studies involved with these uh, phenylpropanes as well and how effective they are. So just re reiterating the, um, the terpenes, the functional groups, and the phenylpropanes as compositions of the chemical compositions and constituents that are in essential oils that heal us. I want to say that phenylpropanes as well are um, a, the precursor is phenylalanine, the amino acid phenylalanine, and I just the connection between plants and humans. It, there's an, there's another, in my opinion, profound connection. So just to talk a little bit more about the functions of these chemical constituents is now we start to see, okay, if I'm going to have citrus and pine and balsam, it's very stimulating and actually quite frankly uplifting and you feel really rejuvenated. And again, it's D-limonene, alpha-pianine, these chemical constituents that are found in it that create this, this, this feeling and the ethereal quality of the oil. Um, sesquiterpenes, particularly German chamomile, has chamazuline in it, which is probably one of the most anti-inflammatory agents on the planet, and it's in German chamomile. So again, it's a, it's a type of a sesquiterpene. Phenols, as I'd mentioned before, and it's just simply giving you an idea of why uh, particularly lemongrass might be sedating, um, simply because of some of the, of the chemical constituents within it. And there you have your oxides that are stimulating with the eucalyptus 1,8-cenial, that's an expectorant and it's a stimulant. So it gives you a little bit of an idea how this works. There's one last thing about that that seems to be uh, uh, confusing for some individuals is the uh, is chemotypes. So within a species, you have a species like eucalyptus, for example. 
eucalyptus, there's, there's over 700 different types of species. Now we're familiar with the uh, eucalyptus globulus and radiata, and there's, as I say, over 700 different species. These are simply different species and they're not chemotypes. The chemical constituents of a hydrocarbon and functional group, this is something else that again, once again, is not a chemotype. It's simply the chemical constituent. And I talked about 1-H-cineol, limonene, uh, linalool. These are all functional groups or they're monoterpenes or sesquiterpenes, but they are not chemotypes. So what is a chemotype? Chemotypes are essential oils that have been extracted from one botanical spe species. So if we look back at eucalyptus, we see that there are 700 species and uh, globulus and radiata is, are two of them. With chemotypes, you take rosemary, for example, and it is one species, yet it yields distinctly different chemical compositions. And why is this? Because many factors influence the chemical composition of a given essential oil where it's grown, the different altitude, uh, prevailing climactic conditions. And historically, essential oils, it, it's these three oils that historically have chemotypes. Things are changing a little bit. Uh, just speaking with my colleague, Neil, we were talking about um, how there seems to be a chemotype now with chamomile and, uh, and that type of a thing. So what, what, why would somebody want a specific chemotype? As an, as an aromatherapist or a naturopathic doctor, a nutritionist, you may want a, a rosemary that's going to help as an expectorant. So you're gonna go with a rosemary that has the 1-8-cineol in it because that is an expectorant and we know it is. A camphor uh, chemotype in rosemary is going to help with a, a few things. Camphor is known to be help with um, cognitive thought and it helps again instill, uh, it helps you remember. And I should be sniffing it right now, I think. <laughs> that would be helpful. And, uh, but verbenon is a type of rosemary. They talk about rose using rosemary for the skin. Ver verbenon is very gentle and very anti-aging, and it helps to tighten the skin. But yet it is uh, the other rosemaries would be a little bit too harsh on the skin. Each chemotype elicits a specific physical response, and you'll see that Thyme has nine different chemotypes. Basil has four different chemotypes. How it is represented on the label is also very important. It's typically underneath the Latin name, and you'll have the CT either before or after the rest of the description. So in this case with camphor, it'll have R camphor CT, or it may have CT R camphor. If someone has on a label the word chemotype and, and then linalool, that is not a chemotype. I'm seeing many different, many different manufacturers that are taking lavender and having it, lavender, uh, lavandula augustifolia, which is a, a true lavender, and they're putting in the description, the ingredients, they're putting chemotype and then linalool. This is not a chemotype. So it's simply to try to help you understand what a chemotype is. I'm not sure why they're doing this, but I certainly know that in Europe, anything with linalool has to be documented on the label, but they don't call it a chemotype. They simply call it a chemical constituent within the oil. Now, the olfactory system and the limbic system is when we breathe in essential oils, this, this is precisely what is going on, this chemical dance between the, the chemical constituents within the essential oils and the reaction of our body as well. It, it's, it, if uh, we think about the olfactory system, the olfactory system is our breathing apparatus, and when we breathe in any odorant molecules, they become attached to cilia as well as uh, to, neuro, uh, to neuroproteins that ultimately be, uh, become uh, attached to the um, olfactory bulb. You'll see the olfactory bulb at the very end of our nasal cavity. The olfactory bulb is attached to the brain and particularly the limbic system. The limbic system houses uh, the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, uh, the hippocampus and the amygdala. The amygdala and the hippocampus are, are the two parts of the brain that are profoundly affected by odor and by scent. And it, with the amygdala, this is where we develop our emotions. Our emotional response is the amygdala. Think about essential oils that you smell that absolutely 
uh, take you back uh, to, uh, to when you were a child. This is the hippocampus working. Or, but also that really calm you down. And that really is the, the amygdala portion of the brain where the essential oils are affecting. There's also essential oils study after study that shows their efficacy in triggering dopamine production, uh, serotonin production, et cetera. So topical application, when we are, we are carefully applying it, uh, we're often marrying different carrier oils along with the, um, the essential oils. Now you're using carrier oils that would also have the benefit that the, um, that may have the same benefit as the essential oil. For example, for pain, you may look at a carrier oil that's anti-inflammatory, such as jojoba oil, or evening primrose oil, um, even shea nut oil as well. Blending essential oils and carrier oils, as an aromatherapist, the first thing they teach you is that, um, number one, uh, how to blend essential oils so that you're not um, overindulging in the oils. The, there are six drops is a 1% solution in 30 mils. If we think about 30 mils of carrier oil, you have uh, three, 600 drops. If you add six drops, that's a 1% solution, 12 drops, a 2% solution, and 18 drops, a 3% solution. If you're using one oil in your formula, you would only use six drops. If you're using two, you can use up to 12. And if you're using three or more, you can use 18 drops. And this is if you're using the solution in its entirety. If you're going to be using it as a spot treatment, you can use up to 30 drops of, of oil because you're only applying a small amount of it. When you're looking at application for children, these types of solutions are imperative to know because they're often talking about a 1% solution or a 0.5% solution. And so this is giving you an idea of how you measure that out. Inhalation, a few things just about in inhalation. You need very, very little to accomplish your results. It's recommended that if you're using it therapeutically that you expose yourself directly to the diffuser for 20 minutes. The half-life is 45 minutes. And so every hour and a half, you could uh, use a procedure. And you, it would be a very effective procedure. It, they say that when you are using essential oils, that you do not expose yourself directly for longer than two hours. This is if you are directly exposed to the diffuser and the oils. Please don't feel that you have to be cautionary if you have it in your home and, and you have a, you know, a 3,000 square foot house with several different diffusers running. That's, that's not the cautionary note. It's simply if you're using it as a therapy. And think about if you go to sleep. Many people love to go to sleep and have the diffuser beside their head. And they sleep all night with it. And again, if you're doing it, try to get a diffuser that has a timer that you can time it for simply for as the maximum two hours. Topically, if you're using it uh, topically, and I've given you the formula for the topical application, three to six hours is when the expulsion rate for the typical person. If people are uh, chronically ill with autoimmune disease, heart disease, any type of illnesses, the expulsion rate can be as long as 16 hours. So the application of that 30 mil preparation that you've made would, would be once a day. Where do you apply the oils? For, for the most part, if you're applying the oils to help you go to sleep or whatever the case may be, applying it to the bottom of the feet seems to be uh, the, the most effective way. Um, certainly less prone to sensitiv sensitivity from the oils and also reduces the possibility of reaction, but you're going to have a very effective absorption rate of it as well. If you think about um, a reflexology, the whole, uh, the, the whole body, the entire body, is, is outlined on, on the bottom of the feet as well. So talking a little bit about the essential oils and their bactericides, uh, because I've spoken so much about it, I'd like to give you some proof uh, where there many studies are being done. Tea tree oil for gram-positive bacteria. If we think about a Streptococcus aureus from, that is really a, a pathogen that's debilitating many hospitals, it can be uh, very, very benign and superficial, but it can also become a pathogen. It's a, a type of strep that is immune to antibiotic. It's antibiotic resistant. And there have been many studies that show 
using tea tree oil in a cleanser to wash your hands, using it on surfaces kills the, uh, kills the bacteria. And I'm going to show you some studies that have been done that really uh, indicate this as well. Cinnamon bark, and I spoke about uh, the phenol aspect of cinnamon bark and how, how much of a bacteriocide it is. And it affects bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, and certainly has been shown um, it, uh, with the um, organosa bacteria that it's an opportunist human pathogen. It creates biofilms that antibiotics cannot destroy. And I'm going to show you a, the study that was done with that. But first, the study on, on tea tree and staphylococcus. Um, this was shown, they used a, a clone tea tree that where they really sort, they, they pumped up the, the, uh, the strength of some of the constituents that are in uh, tea tree oil. But they also used a standard tea tree oil and I think that that's what's more indicative here of how effective it is. If we look at the standard tea tree oil, it took six hours for it to, of exposure to the bacteria to kill the bacteria, whereas their clone 88 killed it within four hours. I think it's more significant that we know that our tea tree oil that we sell, and they purchased the tea tree oil from a health food store. So it the regular tea tree oil. It's, the URL is on here as well, and it's a pretty interesting study showing exposure to tea tree and killing it within six hours. I have so many examples I could give you, but unfortunately I don't have the time. The plantonic bacteria that I spoke about that creates a biofilm is where uh, antibiotics just have no, they just, they're not successful whatsoever. If we look here on the left side, you'll see that the colistin, which is an, anti, which is an antibiotic, um, it, it, if the little green particles represent live bacteria. And so after the colistin, it showed that it, it got rid of uh, quite a bit of the live bacteria, but didn't touch the biofilm. Interesting with the ca cinnamon casea at 0.2%, very, very mild uh, um, amounts showed that it, it somewhat killed the bacteria, but it destroyed the biofilm. And this is part of the really important aspect of this, that it did completely destroy the biofilm. Of course, a 0.1% casea did not touch either of them either. So the, the uh, concentration is important as well. A little bit about alopecia. Um, this, this particular study was, has been duplicated uh, by several different dermatologists. And what they did was they looked historically what humans have been using for hair loss for over the last two, three, four hundred years. And lo and behold, it was a combination of these oils. And so the, if you look at this study online, you will be astounded at the difference within seven months. A person that was almost completely bald and that had been diagnosed with alopecia, which is an autoimmune disease, um, ultimately within seven months had a full head of hair. It's quite remarkable. Um, also sedative for, uh, formulas with, with cedarwood, lavender, and Roman chamomile. Again, studies that support its, its um, uh, powerful calming and uh, uplifting, uh, uplifting application as well. I think, and it's a question on everyone's mind, how do we know that your essential oil is pure? How do we know that it is a good essential oil? Who's responsible for this? The manufacturer is responsible for ensuring uh, that the essential oil is pure. If there's any dis discrepancy in the range with which it's supposed to fall, it's an indication that the oils are not pure or they've been tampered with. And that's where the manufacturer must look a bit further. Gravity is also a really important test that's done. Gravity, again, the, the gravity uh, of the density of the material must fall for each oil within a certain range. I've given you an example of what the gravity, specific gravity for a particular oil might be. If it falls outside of that range, then again, it's an alert for the manufacturer to, to look a little bit further to ensure that it isn't a degraded oil. And of course, infrared spectrum. Infrared spectrum is a fingerprint. If we take a look at the slide here, you're going to see the top, um, the top image is gas chromatography. Each one of those spikes represent a chemical constituent of the, of the particular oil. Uh, the infrared below is the fingerprint of Atlas Cedarwood. All of these are available to you on the NOW website. You can go and look at any of our oils, look at our gas chromatography results, look at the, um, look at the gravity and uh, the refractive index that we've used. So this is what makes uh, an essential oil a, um, 
an unadulterated essential oil. There is no such thing as a therapeutic essential oil. It does not exist. It is a marketing term, and it, you either have a pure essential oil or you do not. The way that you find out that your oil is not um, adulterated is through all of these studies or tests, all of these tests. So another thing to ensure that you have a good quality oil is it, they are always housed in dark bottles. You're always going to see the Latin name underneath the English name. And you're always going to have somewhere on the bottle that it says 100% pure essential oils. Extraction methods vary. Now, CO2 extraction, I was just in, in London at a conference, essential oil conference, and CO2 extraction is becoming very popular because it changes the strength of an oil and it also changes some of the chemical constituents in it. However, what we are finding right now, you may see that maybe in a few years in North America, but what you're finding now is that hard resins are CO2 extracted. CO2 extraction is expensive, and so it's only used where it's needed, where no other method will work. Cold pressed are all of your citrus. Solvent extract, uh, extraction can, uh, is typically with your rose, oil, rose oils and your jasmine because they yield very little amounts of oil within the petals and within the bud. And so what you're going to do is uh, 60,000 rose buds only makes 30 mils or one ounce of rose oil. So you'll find that our uh, that jasmine absolute and rose absolute is often um, is often in combination with a carrier oil. You may only have five percent rose oil simply so that it's affordable. Steam distilled, as I talked about Avicenna, steam distillation is the uh, primary way of extracting. And it's plants, flowers, roots, even frankincense and myrrh, which are resins, are steam distilled. Steam distillation process is simply applying steam or heat to the aromatic plant and it is separated through a condenser. The oil is separated from the water and the water is often sold as hydrosols, as a, a lovely floral water. This is where I'm going to speak to you about marketing regulations and labeling regulations in Canada. Claims and directions for use on are, are, are variable. And it's indicative of the, of the regulatory category that you're, that, you're, that you're using for your essential oil. The possibility to market and label essential oils in different ways there's, is fourfold. You have consumer products, and that's typically what our essential oils are. Uh, uh, the, the, it's in the category of consumer products. This is where we do not state therapeutic use. We simply state of mind. We talk about how, how grounding it might be or uplifting it might be. Uh, this can be diffusion or uh, airborne mist or certainly used topically. But then there's also the possibility, it's just, I think it's been quite recent, that you can receive an NPM or you can apply for an NPN. So it's a natural health product. Uh, the specific therapeutic use can be placed on the label typically using the traditional aromatherapy use. However, no internal application is, is certainly recommended. It's either through inhalation or skin application. There's only eight approved therapeutic claims as well. Tra then uh, traditional or non-traditional use has to meet a burden of proof. And this is the second NPN uh, application that you can apply for where it's historically been used as an herbal remedy and so ultimately this is where possible ingestion may, may be recommended but certainly skin application. I'm going to show you an example of that as well. And of course what, uh, food and cosmetic. Uh, cosmetic generally for essential oils premixed with a carrier oil uh, for perfuming the skin and that's also where, where, our, uh, where we stand with our essential oils as far as how the use is and as far as the um, labeling claims that we're using. No Canadian labeling standard can accommodate multiple regulatory classes. You'll find with our carrier oils, there used to be um, food grade. Uh, we no longer put food, gr food grade on it because that means it's a food, but it's also a cosmetic, and it, this is not allowed within the regulatory accommodations. So uh, there's no, there is no correlation based um, on quality, 
and regulatory category. So if if it's said that the the if it's thought that the product may be a better a more quality product because it has an NPM, this is this is not true. As I said, the quality of an essential oil is is really only indicative of how much how much testing that's done by by the manufacturer. Um, ultimately, it's the manufacturer and not the regulations that determine the quality of the product. Peppermint oil, uh, labeled as a consumer product, uh, refers to a wide array of manufacturing goods. This can, this can be air fresheners and uh, many different things. So this is your, your consumer product. There's no limit to the state of mind that can be, that can be uh, made as claims. And in keeping with uh, the principles of aromatherapy, it applies to every product and there's no approval for this for internal use. This is what our labels look like. You'll see they're very clean and on the side it says 100% pure peppermint oil, minty, fresh, and the, uh, the ethereal qualities again are soothing and vitalizing and this, the process is steam distillation. And these are what our oils look. And you'll see the Latin name underneath the French, the French name. Marketing labels for peppermint for, uh, with, were NHPs. They're used, it's used in aromatherapy as a nervine or a comative uh, to help relieve joint and muscle pain. These are some of the claims that one can make with peppermint. But again, for any, aroma, for any essential oil, you're limited to choose from eight different claims. One of the reasons we, that's one of the reasons we're not going with that, the NPN at this particular time, because you have 80 essential oils that probably could have 800 claims, and we, we are only limited to eight claims. We as a, as a company feel that it's far too confusing for the consumer, and it, the retailer is gonna pull their hair out trying to, uh, it, trying to explain to somebody that although it says it's good for boils, it's also good for fever. So that's something that, that we've decided, well, let's, slow, let's not look at the NPNs yet until we have a lot more claims that we can address. So here are your claims, everything from acne to boils to burns, uh, comatives, uh, relief joint pain, etc. There's no approval for, for uh, internal use, and this is either inhalation or topical use. And this is what your label would look like, and this would be a type of label where you would have to pull, pull it off the bottle as well in order to talk about the, the precautions and, and other uses for it as well. And you'll see here that it says for occasional use only, three to 12 drops uh, in a bowl, or you can use it in undiluted on a handkerchief and smell it. So these again, traditional uses in essential oil and aromatherapy. The last one is the peppermint oil labeled other NHPs. Um, this is the traditional use. It's looking at historically what herbal medicine has used. They've used peppermint oil as a digestive. And so this is what would be used on the, um, uh, uh, certainly on the label as the claim. And this is the one that is approved for internal use simply because of the burden of proof being met through historical aspects. So if we take a look at the label, you'll see that it's recommended 15 years or over, take two drops one to three times daily with food or in water. And uh, the NPN is on it as well. And again, um, at this point, it's, we're, it's really at the baby stage of this. And so we're sitting back and waiting to see how, uh, how things go with Health Canada and their recognition of essential oils. That completes my training for this afternoon. Thank you.